Morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our fifth annual Filmmaker Bootcamp here at TIFF. And first of all, congratulations to those of you who have a film at the festival. You can give it yourselves. Yeah. Uh, my name is Christoph Straub, and I'm the industry programming manager at the festival. I'm joined today by one of my team members, um, Nadia Oliva, who hopefully, hopefully all of you have met already. If not, say hi to her. I think she invited all of you to this. Uh, yes. <laughs> and she has been instrumental in organizing this event today. Um, before we get started, I hope that all of you have a schedule and also something to write on because you'll be taking lots of notes today. Uh, you'll see that we have, after the break, after the lunch break today, breakout sessions as well for short filmmakers and feature filmmakers. If you have any questions about the schedule, you can come to me, myself or Nadia, ask us. And uh, the idea of the boot camp uh, was conceived actually several years ago because we realized that attending the festival can be a pretty overwhelming experience for anyone. Experienced filmmakers, especially of course new ones who have never had a film at the festival. We are extremely glad that Telephone Canada came on board as a supporter for this program, program, and I'm especially happy that Dan Lyon, the regional feature film executive from Telephone for Nunavut and Ontario, is here with us today. Dan has done the boot camp many times. He's a big fan of the initiative, and I'm very glad that he's here. I'd like to ask him to briefly come up and say a few words. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Greetings from Telefilm Canada. Stephanie Azam is in your schedule. She's not here, but she's here in spirit. And uh, we're a team, um, and, uh, and it's the whole Telefilm team, really, that is, uh, that is with you today and uh, through the festival experience. Um, I think I observed uh, one prior year that, that I was lucky enough to come here that um, I have attended the festival wearing almost every hat there is to wear. Uh, one of my favorite years, I was a matchmaker working directly for the festival, uh, matching up uh, uh, films that didn't have uh, sales agents with sales agents who needed films. I've been here as a producer. I've been here as an executive producer. I've been here as a film distributor. And wearing every hat, I've, I've never lost the sense of excitement. So I hope that, that you folks are sharing that sense of excitement. It doesn't get much better than this, except if you happen to be a member of the cast of The Big Bang Theory. Uh, for anyone who reads the trades, that, sh that should have gotten a bigger laugh. I guess these guys don't read the trades. Um, <laughs> Telefilm is delighted to, to be a, a sponsor of this event. It's a great opportunity for networking with each other, networking with industry experts, people from, from TIFF, and to learn about uh, TIFF itself, to learn about publicity, sales, marketing, and distribution, and please soak it all in and enjoy it. Um, an old friend of mine who's a very well-placed person in the, in the business called me about two weeks ago and he said, Dan, I just read this book. You have to read this book. And uh, it's a book by uh, a Harvard professor named Anita Elbers. I've written it down. Uh, it's called Blockbusters, Hit-Making, Risk-Taking, and the Big Business of Entertainment. And uh, this fellow who shall remain nameless thought that reading this book would help me in my decision-making role at, at Telefilm. I've only read about the first 15 pages of the book, and I've put it aside. I'm not sure whether I'll be finishing it, because the thesis is that what content uh, companies and decision-makers should do is take their resources and allocate them uh, to, to intended blockbusters. And, uh, you know, instead of spreading the money uh, around among different product lines. So I called this fellow immediately and I said, well, where would that leave talent development? And he didn't have an answer for that. And on top of that, I was able to tell my own story from my years in distribution where uh, a huge conglomerate had bought the company that I was working for, and I was summoned to the office of the second in command of this giant conglomerate uh, who said, I guess you're wondering why I wanted to see you, and I said yes. He said, well, really, I only have one question. I've reviewed your results for the last few years, and I've reviewed your business plan going forward. 
I don't understand. Why don't you just buy the hits? And, and, uh, and I thought, I looked around to see if I was on candid camera or something, but it, he was a finance guy and he, and he wasn't joking. He really thought that, you know, if you knew your business, you should be able to buy only the most successful films for distribution. Well, we all know that that's uh, ridiculous. And it's the same in filmmaking, frankly. You, you, you do your best, you put together the right elements. Uh, but I do have an important message for you, which is, right from the development stage, you, need, you do need to be keeping the audience in mind. And uh, now that your films are made, you need to probably hone your strategy. It may be that you're gonna be reaching a different audience than that originally intended, but you need to think very carefully and when you meet people uh, at the festival who are in the distribution business, have a very good answer prepared when they ask you, well, who do you think the audience for this film is? Have a good answer for that, and, and uh, uh, please think about it carefully. The other question that you need an answer for is, what's next? So please, please have an answer ready for that question as well. You want to be focused on your current project, but you also want to have something else in your back pocket that will be very interesting to speak about. Most Canadian films, most independent films around the world are lower budget films. And I was really happy to, to notice that in the TIFF programming this year of Canadian films, that uh, fact is represented. So we do have some quite elaborate uh, Canadian films in the festival, but we have many micro budget films, lower budget films, however you want to describe them. And that's a fantastic thing. And we also have uh, a plethora of short films uh, which are an art form unto themselves in addition to being a kind of calling card for people who would like to make features later. So those are my remarks. Have a fantastic day. I'm able to stay with you for a bit, and then as taxpayers, you'll be happy to know that I will be in the office today. <laughs> Thank you, Dan, and thank you for those pieces of advice. Uh, throughout the day, our guest speakers will give you those little nuggets of advice and that will help you navigate the festival. Uh, to, kick off, to kick off our boot camp, we can think also of a better speaker than the person who oversees the vision for the festival. So please join me in welcoming the artistic director of the Toronto International Film Festival, Cameron Bailey. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, I'm glad to see all of you here today for our boot camp. We've been doing this for a few years now. Uh, but if you're new to it, does anybody wonder why we do a boot camp? I mean, making your film you probably think is hard enough and getting into the festival is hard enough. Why do we still need a boot camp? Um, it's because doing the festival is also kind of hard. Um, only because there's a lot going on. We're showing about 290 feature films. We're showing this year with international shorts as well, um, about 100 short films. There are a lot of filmmakers. We've got a about 150 world premieres, so a lot of films that are brand new to everyone, and you're gonna to try to find a way to have your film stand out. Many ways you can do that. You'll learn a lot more about that today. We've got a, an expert, Ryan Werner, here uh, from New York, who's uh, very practiced in the independent film world and the industry, and he can tell you a lot. And I think all of the speakers today you will be able to learn something from. Uh, but you're going to have to do some of this. You're going to have to do a lot of this yourself. Um, it's a matter of just being prepared for the 11 days of the festival, not having it kind of sweep up on you, but actually having a plan going in. Uh, that plan will have a lot to do with uh, making your film stand out, with however you choose to market it and you know if you've made a short film you might think you know marketing is something that I've never really thought that I could do or had the budget to do or the means to do but anybody can market now we have this beautiful thing called the internet and uh, there are ways to do just about anything online now so Make sure you've got a plan to establish a presence for your film. Make sure you've got a way to connect with other filmmakers. This is one of the most important things to do. We have um, an incredible resource in the festival. We're lucky that everybody who's been contributing to building it over the last 39 years has brought it to the place that it's at right now, meaning that 
the whole, just about the whole film world is here. Um, we've got 5,000 industry delegates from all around the world, filmmakers from 70 different countries, media, about 1,200 of them from all over the world. This is your opportunity to actually plug into people who don't live where you live. Um, and sometimes it's your only opportunity during the year to do that. So have a plan to meet the people that you feel like you need to meet. You may not be able to meet that big Hollywood star that you want to cast one day. You may not be able to meet the director that you've idolized for years. But have a realistic plan and connect with the people that you think can actually help you make the films that you want to make. Um, don't go chasing after Robert Downey Jr. because he's probably going to be busy. <laughs> but there are others that I think will be much more useful to you, actually. Um, and then in, in addition to that, I think probably the most important thing to do, and this is hard to do when you have a film of your own in the festival, for me the most important thing to do is to see movies. Just see as many films as you can. Uh, again, it is a resource that's available to you sometimes just once a year, even with Netflix and Mubi and everything else. Um, there are some films that just never make it into distribution and they're just not available apart from festival screenings. So. Track down the films that look interesting to you. I always think it's useful to see films that are within the ambitions of your next project. So, you know, a $20 million movie with big movie stars is interesting to see, but that may not be what's going to let you give you ideas for your next film, maybe something more within the range of what you want to do next. And when you're watching films, I would try to kind of just erase the border, you know? I mean, you're making films from your own particular location, but don't think of yourselves as just Canadian filmmakers, because Canadian filmmakers are making movies all over the world right now. Um, you know, whether it is Jean-Marc Vallée or uh, Philippe Falardeau um, or uh, Richie Mehta or Deepa Mehta, people are making films all over the world. You can too. Um, and that just gives you a lot more opportunities. So when you're watching movies, watch movies from all over. I would actually, I mean, I would start with some of the Canadian films. Uh, Xavier Dolan's film Mommy is amazing. Uh, I think you'd want to see Jean-Marc Vallée's film Wild. There's a great French film called May Allah Bless France, which is probably around the sort of one, two million dollar range um, that, uh, um, you know, is also, I think, something that's well worth watching. So choose the movies to see, choose the people that you want to meet, um, have a plan to get your film out there, and then I think you'll have a great festival. And I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it to the rest of the experts here. So enjoy the day. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, and throughout the day, we'll have our internal departments, festival programming, the industry office come to you and talk to you about the resources that are available at the festival. Every year, we ask an international industry expert to join us for Filmmaker Bootcamp and provide an overview of the independent film industry, the international festival circuit, and uh, our festival's place in that festival circuit. Uh, the session is really designed to give all of you an overview of the macrocosm that we, we, all, we all work in. This year, we are particularly excited to have Ryan Werner join us as the keynote speaker. As you can see from his bio, and you'll have all the bios as part of your schedules, Ryan is a, an experienced executive who has worked on festival launches and theatrical releases of countless films by some of the world's leading auteurs and up-and-coming filmmakers as well. Ryan is currently a senior executive at Cinetic Media, where he works with distributors and filmmakers on marketing, publicity, and dis distribution campaigns. Among the films and TV shows he has worked on are Richard Linklater's Boyhood, Paolo Sorrentino's The Great Beauty, Chia Coppola's Palo Alto, and many more. Upcoming films include Jean-Luc Godard's Goodbye to Language, Jean-Pierre and Luc Dondin's Two Days, One Night, and Olivier Asayas's Clouds of Sils Maria. Prior to that, Ryan was a senior vice president of marketing and publicity at IFC Films, overseeing hundreds of campaigns, including the Academy Award nominated In the Loop, how to Survive a Plague, Pina, as well as films by Steven Soderbergh, Gus Van Sant, Spike Lee, Werner Herzog, Lena Dunham, Olivier Sayas, Ken Loach, Mike Michael Winterbottom, Steve McQueen, and so many more. <laughs> I'll stop now. He's currently also a programmer at large at BAM Cinematic in Brooklyn. He lives in New York, but he's here on his way to Locarni, Lucarno. So please join me in welcoming Ryan Werner. Hello. Um, I'm glad that you said that because I was nervous to introduce myself because it made me feel like I was going to be on um, a date or something. So, um, and I'm also glad everyone introduced themselves because everyone seemed really nice and I was definitely a little bit nervous um, to be presented as an industry expert. I guess it kind of makes 
me feel old and um, but I guess why maybe why I'm qualified to come here and talk about what to expect at the festival um, is because I've been coming here for a long time I've been coming since 1998 um, every year and I've changed jobs um, but pretty much more or less done the same thing um, since then I do marketing and publicity I've done acquisitions and distribution but really I think what I would say I like to do is like promote movies and help release them and get them seen. Um, so I thought today I would just talk a little bit, um, but I'll also open it up to questions because um, I think that's probably a better use of time because uh, you probably have a lot of questions and for me to just stand here for an hour and speak would be incredibly boring. Um, but so I guess one of the first things I thought about was like, how has the festival changed? And like, I wanted to talk about the marketplace a little bit as you're coming into the festival as new filmmakers. Um, and, you know, I think 1988 was like, is that 16 years ago? I don't know if it's not 16. Let's just pretend it was. Um, but uh, it's really different. I mean, when I first started coming here, almost all of the films were shot in some way on film. Almost all of them were projected on film. Um, there were very few distributors. There was very few deals happening. I mean, the majority of films would go home without any distribution. Um, festivals were the only way for a lot of these films to be seen. And um, also, like, there was uh, very, there was much less press there was no social media i mean and also the way we communicated it was crazy i mean it was really like at a festival we would like you know have to wait for the reviews to come out in paper papers or um very few websites were really up and running so it's really changed a lot i mean you know people had pagers um so it was like a whole it was the era of like roberto benini when he was popular so um <laughs> That was my first year, and now, like, you know, like, 16 years later, I think it's, like, a completely um, different world, and I think the only thing that hasn't really changed is that um, the Toronto International Film Festival is still, like, one of the most important places to launch um, your film, I and mean, it's one of the, a handful of, like, elite festivals where people from all over the world come. I mean, you'll have a, um audience of, like, some of the most important people that work in what we all do. Um, buyers, press, distributors, exhibitors, festival programmers. And I think we can talk about like why it's important to think about who's at the festival in a minute. But um, I think it's great. And I think, like Cameron said, you should really take advantage of it and see as many films as you can. I mean, for me, the festival has been a really important part of understanding like that cinema is like a huge um, international thing like and it's a way we can learn about other people's cultures and learn about each other and also see very bizarre um, things too um, <laughs> like some of you described which I can't wait to see um, so um, one of the things that I got asked was before I came here is like if I still think there's like a theatrical audience um, for films. Like, is there a future for people going to movies, theaters to see films? And I just wanted to say, I, I mean, personally, I think that there is. Um, on a practical level, theatrical is the period when the most people find out about your film. It's like when the reviews come out, when all the marketing hits. So I think for that important, for that reason, it's important. But I also think um, it's, you know, it's why we're all in film because we probably love to go to the movies and, and watch films. And I think um, that will continue. I mean, I think the studios are doing more tentpole type films. And even as there's so many movies coming out every week, um, they're still amazing um, experiences. I think it's just like harder to get people's attention and films have to be um, special. I mean, like, I've been working on that movie Boyhood for this summer, and it's really been um, an amazing experience watching like people come to the theater in droves to see it all over the country. Um, in fact, I went on this um, promotional tour with Richard Linklater, and as I realized I had to speak to you, he's been speaking like basically all over the country um, this summer, and I happened to be sitting next to this um, kid at Pixar who was like listening, and he only wrote one note down during the whole speech, which is like time equals structure 
which I happen to look over his shoulder and see him write it down. But I thought that was a really great note. So hopefully I'll say something as good as that so you can write that down. I doubt it, but I'll try. Um, so, uh, you know, I thought, you know, one, one thing about the marketplace is that there are so many films being made, like I just said. Um, the cost of production has fallen so much. Anyone can make a movie, and really anybody does. And it's questionable if that's good or bad. I mean, I tend to think it's good because... Um, there's so much creativity. I mean, there's movie, there's a lot of movies being made that you could arguably say, like, you've never seen anything like it before. Um, I think Boyhood is an example. I think movies like Beasts of the Southern, uh, Southern Wild or thinking back to a movie like Tarnation or even the documentary Room 237 about the, like, theories about The Shining. I think, you know, the fact that people can make movies like that is pretty amazing. Um... You know, I think Toronto and Sundance both have said over 4,000 features have been submitted in many more shorts, which is a staggering number. Um, so you should feel extra proud that you're here because um, it's fierce competition. Um, in New York, where I live, the New York Times reviews every movie that's released every Friday um, and sometimes on Wednesday. And that number is often between 15 to sometimes 30 films. The same as LA, the LA Times probably reviews sometimes a little bit more. So it's really, really competitive out there and it's really hard to get attention. But, um, and I think that's definitely a challenge facing filmmakers. But, um, you know, I think there are, I mean, and there are definitely other challenges. I mean, at the BAM Cinema Fest, which I um, helped program in Brooklyn, I spent a lot of time talking to the filmmakers about the challenges they're facing. Like, it's harder to make a living. It's hard to get attention. There's so many um, other filmmakers um, with with trying to push their films out. Filmmakers, I think, and producers are feeling like they're being required to do so much more work, like through social media, to coming up with marketing ideas. And I think that really is like something um interesting like uh the filmmakers i work with often like come in with full marketing plans and and like ideas about the trailer and poster and that's something that's really shifted also in like the 16 years i've come it used to be like if a distributor bought your movie they would basically just take the reins and tell you this is your poster this is your trailer and this is how we're releasing the movie you can show up and do some interviews and we'll have a premiere but that's that's it and now it's much more i think a collaboration i don't think and the way the world is set up with social media um, and the internet that re that you can't have a voice in how your film is distributed, which I think is a great thing. But I think it's also cha a challenging time. I mean, companies are paying less for movies. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of producers and filmmakers I know are m juggling multiple projects, um, trying to work in TV so they can make more money. Um, so I, I think there's like a lot of challenges. So, but I think... At the same time, um, I was just at the Sundance um, Producer Summit over the weekend, which is a meeting of like filmmakers and producers and industry people where we talk about the state of the industry. And there was like one night where everyone got together and it was asked like of everybody, do you feel more, more or less optimistic about the state of the film industry? And I think the majority of people, um, almost I would say 95% felt optimistic. And I think... Um, a big part of that is because um, there's so many ways you can watch movies now. There's there, it's it's really like if you think back, um, especially if I think back, like I remember, like you know, I would have to go to the video store to get movies, and it was like so hard to see them, and it was like you'd stand at the counter and like hope that someone would return like something new. Um, but now, like really, you can watch films anywhere. I mean iTunes, Amazon, Netflix, Vimeo, um, Hulu, Crackle, Mubi, I mean, Fandor, the list goes on and on. I mean, and it's really kind of amazing. You have like literally the whole history of cinema at your fingertips and you can go on YouTube and watch crazy stuff that people are just making at home. I think it's a great um, moment uh, for for movies. Um, and if you're a filmmaker and you don't get distribution, you can also take matters into your own hand. There's um, many services. Vimeo is a great one where you can put your film up and you can 
um, reach audiences today through social media. I mean, it's very, a lot of the most successful movies I've worked on, especially on the documentary front, are films where we could really target the audience. Like um, dance movies like Pina or First Position or this documentary I worked on called Buck, which is a, a horse whisperer that, where we could reach out to the horse community. I mean, it's like all these crazy things. I mean, but it's really, um, I think, um, a great opportunity for filmmakers. Um, so I think all that stuff is like a challenge and an opportunity as you come into the festival. And, um, but I think more and more films find some form of distribution. And I think, you know, that's, that's probably a lot of filmmakers goals when they come to the festival. Um, but personally, if I were you, I mean, you should certainly have that in mind, but I think there's a lot of other, um, important things you can get out of the festival. Um, and part of that is just like knowing who's going to be at the festival. Um, of course, there's buyers. Um, there's many less um, companies that are owned by studios. Like there used to, every studio used to have an independent division in the U.S., but now there's Sony Classics, Fox Searchlight, and Focus. Um, but there are many independent distributors like IFC Films and Magnolia. There's smaller um, distributors like Kino. Um, and I'm blinking, but there's tons of them and you can look them up, um, on the industry guide. Um, I won't bore you with all the names, but you know, these companies like right now are back in New York and LA and other parts of the country. And they're like scouring over the lineup and trying to figure out what all of your films are and all the other films are. And, you know, every one of these companies has kind of their own agenda. Like some companies specialize in genre films, some companies specialize in, um, you know, classy type uh films other uh you know others are more challenge uh, are more adventurous some are will take whatever they can get but um there's a whole bunch of different distributors and like there's these young people at every company making lists of like your films and putting them typing them into a database so they can create these books to bring to toronto um typically like these companies will make a list like these are this is our a list of films we want to see based on synopsis or trailers and all that stuff so we can, we'll talk about that in a minute but um that's kind of what happens and uh they'll all be here very soon and you'll probably meet a lot of them um the other like another really important group of people is festival programmers um and these people come from all over the world and are in many ways after tiff going to be your next step to finding an audience. Um, even if you find distribution, it's still important that these programmers come in to um, see your movie because um, they're part of the promotion of a distribution. Distrib uh, they're part of the promotion that distributors use. They're also, um, in some ways, like a substitute form of distribution. Um, so it's, you know, and these are people that like you'll be working with for the rest of your career. So whether it's from Sundance or Cannes or Berlin or more regional festivals like um, Chicago or San Francisco or Vancouver, or there's, there's just, there's so many of them. Um, and, you know, they look for different kinds of movies. There's for genre films, there's like Fantastic Fest and Fantasia and Sit Sitka's and like there's there's something for really for everybody. Um, so those are good people to know. And they're also often like my favorite people to know because you can talk about movies with them and um, they appreciate uh, films. Um, agents and managers will also arrive in force. And these are the people that will kind of like help you um, through your career, like find new projects, introduce you to people, bring talent to you, bring finance to you. Um, these are the people that often come from LA and you can't miss them, but, um, <laughs> but they're there and they're looking for new talent all the time. Um, and then also the press. The press um, are here because it's a public event to report on what's happening. They. Um, often do interviews, they do day-by-day -day, um, reports online and print. Um, from the U.S., they come almost from every major city, like the major daily paper, the weeklies, um, all the online sites, TV stations send people up. So, you know, this is how um, the word of your film can travel around the world. And these people 
often are what distributors pay attention to. Distributors um, want to hear what the press thinks about your film. They might like a film, but they might want to hear what the New York Times thinks or what Variety thinks. So um, it's an incredibly important group of people to have. Um, so, you know, what can you do before the festival um, to prepare to deal with all of these people? Um, a lot of things. I'm, I'm going to be working on like six or seven films at the festival. And like what we're doing right now is we're just dealing with the materials. Like what are the images for the movie? The images are important because it's the first thing people often see of your movie. It can, can convey the mood, the genre, um, you know, often times you want something that people are going to stop and look at um, whether it's like an, something an action shot like a really good looking actor or you know something um, so that's what um, I've been doing all week is just looking at images from the different movies I'm working on um, and we've also been working on the synopsis the synopsis is um, I always think not too long catchy and kind of conveys a sense of what the movie's going to be like what the experience is like if you can kind of understand what the movie um might be like or what kind of emotion you might get out of it i feel like that's always a successful synopsis um you know there's been movies that where the synopsis alone has convinced me that like this is a film i've got to work on the perfect example i can think of is the movie the human centipede which just the title alone did a good job but when i read the three sentence synopsis we were like my old boss and i like, we're okay we're buying this movie um so think about the synopsis um and then the press kit the press kit is um something that often it, people just put in the synopsis like the casting crew and no, nothing else and you know it's something that the press is going to get about your film and when the press has like over 400 films um that they're dealing with and they need to write about your film they'll often f open it up and if they like your film they might often just copy something straight out of the press kit so it's really important to have a good press kit i often think if you don't have time to have someone write one um you can just do a quick Q and A, like where you list, um, you ask yourself questions about, like, you know, tell me about how this film came to be, and then you can also talk about, like, like you know, what makes this film important and why you think it's special. Um, it's really easy to do. I mean, you know all the answers, but it's really like a great resource to have, and it and it, um, you know, it can be used throughout the entire release of the film. I mean, the distributors will probably use it. They might adapt it a little bit, but it's great. Um, often, also, you're asked for a poster and a trailer. I think the jury is really out um, on if you need to do that for a festival. I mean, I think festivals like to have them because it helps sell tickets. And I think oftentimes it is a good idea because um, you can premiere it online before. You'll get some attention for it. Um, you know, you're showing basically um, a marketing piece that can um, show why your film might be sellable. Um, but at the same time, if you don't have the money or the resources to do it well, I don't really think it's worth doing. I think oftentimes for genre films, it's really a good idea like to have a trailer and a poster because, you know, oftentimes the sale is like done based on how marketable those kinds of films are. But if you have, um, but if you don't have them, I think it's totally fine i don't think it hurts the movie um so then the other question is you know who sh who should be in your team at the festival like you can come alone and i think it's for a lot of short filmmakers that's probably um what happens but for feature films looking for distribution it's often like practical to have a sales agent um, the sales agent is someone that knows the marketplace, knows the buyers, knows what people are looking for. Really, like a good sales agent knows like the films the distributor has on their slate already, and how much room they have for other films. Um, they can tell you anything you want to know about um, them, and they can also help you like figure out who you want to approach. Like, um, you know, and I think a good sales agent never rules anything out. Like, you know, it's often about the deal and sometimes there's very creative deals can be made. Um, so that's an important person to have with you. Um, you don't have to have one. I mean, I know there's been filmmakers like um, 
Joe Swanberg like sold his film to um, Magnolia and Paramount at Sundance by himself. But I think you then you need a lawyer to kind of do the deal. Um, but basically, it's I would advise it. And there's plenty of good sales agents. And if you need recommendations, you can probably just look in the industry guide, or you can ask me later. Um, a publicist is a very good person to have with you because this is the person that from the minute the lineup gets announced can start talking to the press and helping them differentiate your film from everything else that's out there. I mean, there's literally like, even for me, like it's completely overwhelming to come here and look at, have the catalog. I mean, it's, I'm horrible at remembering titles and like when it's a whole new group of films that I haven't seen them yet, it's like, I just, I don't, I can't remember them. So, um, the publicist's job is to like ingrain in the press, like what your movie is and, and to get them to come. And it's important, like for a number of reasons, it's not also just about like if they're going to write about you, but like the publicist can give the sales agent, um, you know, a list of who came to the movie, what the reactions were to the movie. And oftentimes this, the sales agent would then take the reactions from the various press and forward it to all the buyers and say, look, everyone loves this movie. Um, and that's really important because at the end of the day, um, even when the movie opens, the press is going to be something that really drives your film forward. And it doesn't have to be also... Um, you know, across the board, great. Sometimes, like, divisive films can sell. And, and you know, those are often my favorite kind of movies. I mean, I've worked on movies that have premiered at festivals like Che or Antichrist or Enter the Void um, that got, like, really crazy responses, like, horrible, like, boo, boo that can, and then, like, other people coming to its defense. So it doesn't always have to be totally pos positive. Um, so... You know, I think just to kind of wrap up my talking uh, is that really anything can happen at the festival. I think it's really about what you make of it. Um, I have made one of the crazy things about the festival is I've made so many good friends here over the years, like just randomly people will start talking to you. And I think it's always interesting. I mean, you can meet people online. Um, you never know who you're going to be. Um, with and you know years later some of these people are like some of my best friends and also um you know very important business things have come out of it too so i think you know just be open to meeting people go to as many movies as you can go to as many events as you can i mean it's really like even if you're not social like usually the first day i arrive i'm kind of like dreading like running into so many people and get like really nervous and like then you settle in and it's great. But um, I think, yeah, I can't advise you enough to um, just have fun also and meet people. And things will happen that are going to happen with your movie if, if you're prepared and you have a good team of people with you. Thank you for being uh, so nice. I can't wait to see your movies.